Round like a circle in a spiral, like a wheel within a wheel, never ending or beginning, like the circles that you find in the windmills of your mind. Visit stogiegeeks.com forward slash debonair for a list of retailers who carry debonair cigars. Buy some today and get a little more debonair. Welcome back to the Stogie Geek Show. This is episode 208 for November 7th, 2016. Will Cooper is in Studio C in North Carolina. Mark and Riley are at the controls at the Vilger North America Studios up in Rhode Island. Paul has the night off. Paul should be back next week. Um, and we're very fortunate to have our special guest co-host, John Reiner, who, uh, really, again, really appreciate it. I know you have a lot going on right now, John. So thank you so much for making the time. No worries, brother. I'm happy to be on. We're, we're done opening stores for the year. So, you know, it's a bit of a slow period before I go on assignment as of Friday. So good, good timing. Yep, yep, and I know, uh, I know, definitely, there's a lot going on with you, um, and you know, I know you're up in Canada, um, but obviously, you know, we have a little thing going on tomorrow called an election. <laughs> um, what? That's first yeah. I've heard of this. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, <laughs> in case you haven't saw it, it's it's on Facebook, um, and I'll be honest, uh, you know, I've been really discouraged by, and I'm not talking about people can talk about candidates. We're not going to get political, but I've just been. There's been a lot of, I think, negativity and argumentativeness and yeah. kind of everything against the debonair ideal. But I wanted to yeah. do something. Yeah, it, it, it has been. And, and, and everyone knows who you are. OK. And, and have I gotten roped into it a couple of times? Yeah. And I realized I had to pull back. <laughs> OK. Um, so but I'm not going to you know, go there because I think, again, look, vote tomorrow is what I'm going to tell you. Is vote tomorrow. You could be like Absolutely. you have to at least you have a choice, not like in Nicaragua. OK, so exactly. Uh, Don't let your voice that. be heard on Facebook. Let your voice be heard at the voting booth. Yeah, exa exactly. Um, but, you know, I wanted to do something for Election Day. And, and um, so I kind of was thinking, you know, in the U.S., we have a lot of times uh, in the vote uh, voting booths, there's, there's these ballot questions where you basically say, do I want to give money to fund this particular highway project? Or, you know, should we actually, there's some smoking ban ones that are on there that you can vote yes or no. So I kind of said, all right, what are some things that we can do from an election standpoint with cigars? And, and, and again, not tie it to the whole cigar rights <laughs> thing. And I'm calling these ballot questions. Um, and maybe this will be a Stogie Geeks tradition every the Monday before Election Day. And these are basically the way it's going to work is uh, I'm going to read off uh, two ballot choices. OK, and you vote for one or the other or you can write in your own vote, John. So as I read this, if you don't like the choice and you want to vote in for this, you can. <laughs> there's no there's no wrong answer here. But I think these are kind of questions that they're not they're, they're questions I hear a lot from cigar enthusiasts a lot, you know, A or B, you know. So, okay. um, yeah, so let's hit it. And OK, so let's start with the first one. Um, and I'm going to go to a brand uh, and the brand is Undercrown. And I'm going to say the, the the choices are under crown or under crown shade. Well, you're hit, you're hitting the tough ones right out of the gate. Now, do I get to do I get to do my live pick or do I have to write in my ballot? Uh, you do. No, you could do a live pick. We'll do a live pick. So we'll do it interactive okay. as we go along. You have to get. So this is that secret ballot, unfortunately. <laughs> we're, 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 well, we're changing the yeah, we're changing the rules. Changing here. it up. <laughs> and folks so who are in the chat room, I, yeah. So I can take a picture of my choice. That's to that's totally legal. No secret ballots. No secret ballots. Well, I think, and that's a tough choice because I think, and if Paul were here, he'd probably have a different answer because I know Paul loves Connecticut and Drew Estate, the Undercrown Shade, came out. It was a very different release, and I think it was in, in a very left turn from what we typically see from Drew Estate. I mean, going from you know all their cigars are medium medium plus and you come out with the undercrown shade which still has that core component 
for me, I'm gonna have to. I'm gonna have to go. The classic Undercrown for me is so tough to beat. Even though I love the Undercrown shade, I gotta stick with what I know, and what I know is is the Undercrown. What about you, Coop? Okay, so I'll say, assuming the nominee is the Undercrown Corona Viva, outstanding, outstanding bell yeah. of the ball. Yeah, that's the. Like I said so. It would be a very now. I'd be honest. I might go shade if there wasn't a Corona Viva. Oh. Yeah, but I'm going. I'm gonna go. So I think we're in agreement on that. When we both have voted uh, Undercrown on that one. Yeah, and I agree. Without that Corona Viva, if you take that Corona Viva away, I think I'm probably going to gravitate towards the Undercrown shade. But that Corona Viva, bell the ball all day long and twice on Sundays. Yep. So the second one, and you can nominate. You can nominate a blend on this one, okay? And if you want to nominate a size, that's fine too with any of these, but. Padron 1926 or Padron 1964? Oh, now this is this is one that if you ask this question in a B and M, you could start a 45 minute engaged discussion that might get a little loud. Um, it, and you yeah, know, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I think what's tough within those line, and you know, you guys talk about this every week. You've got you've got two competing rappers in both sides. You've got the natural and you've got the Maduro. Some people really gravitate towards the natural. Some people really gravitate towards the the Maduro. Now, taking price out of it, because price is a factor. The nineteen twenty six is a premium cigar at a premium price point. That's a really tough pick because you know my gut says I I always gravitate towards the sixty four not just because it's it's fantastic both in the natural and the Maduro but at the price point it's a steal for the for the smoking experience but blind without that price point I I just I can't see myself picking against the twenty six that twenty six is just it's an amazing cigar I think it might be one of the one of the few cigars in the market that I consistently come back to and say this is the cigar that's almost perfect that I measure other cigars by. I went twenty six, very similar reasons for you. Um, the other thing I'll say is when if I'm gonna if I'm gonna fork out for a box purchase of Padrones which yep. I'm probably going to be doing at the end of this month because there's a George Padron event. And um, for Stogie Geeks fans, it looks like we have another interview with Padron at that event, which I'm very excited about. Nice. Um, but because I think the 26 is aged better and they, they hold up better with age, I'm going to go 26 there. But you're right. You know, I, I didn't say these weren't controversial questions because <laughs> I've seen debates start in cigar stores about this. And on Absolutely. this show, we, we've had some major discussions on the show about this as well. Now, within that 26, Coop, I'm going to throw a curveball at you because the write-in vote, are you going the 26 natural or are you going the 26 Maduro? The Maduro, number, yeah, the Maduro and specifically the number nine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm on the same page, 100%. Yeah, but that's the natural is really good, too. It's really good, yeah. Yeah, no, I agree. But, you know, it's kind of funny because I've had the 64, the TAA 64s, and I like, you know, I like the Maduro in some sizes, and I like the natural and the regular 64 better, so... You know, and you and you know, talking about bell of the ball sizes, one of the sizes in the sixty four that I think gets overlooked. I think Paul talked about it a couple of weeks ago. The Principe, it's it's uh, a little Vitola, it's incredible. It, it it is. It's one of the best. You know, I I would say that's a petite Corona. Would you say it's a box press? That petite sounds right. Corona? Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, and it's 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 still a little pricey. I mean, they go for about ten bucks, but it, you're really yeah. going to get a, a great cigar for ten bucks with that price. No question. Yeah, no, yeah. no one forks out money for a Padron and then says they had a bad smoking experience. That just doesn't happen. Exactly, exactly. So the next question, this is a generic question. It kind of fits in with Debonair because Debonair uh, offers uh, their Debonair and Indian motorcycle blends in both of these options. But we're going to make this a generic question here. Habano or Maduro? You have to oh, vote for I, one. Now you're hitting me where I live and breathe because... Uh, I think if if you had said this question to me last year, my my natural gut instinct is Maduro, Maduro, Maduro. But one of the things that is you know we've seen the last year, maybe even the last year and a half, is some of these habanos, especially specifically the Ecuadorian habanos, have been coming out, and these blends have just been firing on all cylinders, and you know they're outstanding. And you talk you're talking about aging on the 26. One of the things that I really like on the Ecuador and Habano, where some of the Maduros, they kind of maybe peak out after 12 or 18 months. 
I, I've not found that with the Ecuadorian Habano wrapper where they continue to age and you come back to that cigar a year and a half, two years later, and it's still going. So for me, I'm going to have to go Ecuadorian Habano. What about you, Coop? Uh, well, I think we're three for three. And again, gun to my head with all uh, the Habano uh, for exactly the same reasons. I get very frustrated with Maduro in where I live, not because there's not great cigars that come out, but what happens is it's they tend when they come in the summer, they're too wet. Right. Mm-hmm. So I have to wait to smoke them. And then, Absolutely. like you said, there's a point where these Maduros, I do think they, they start to lose their age quicker um, for whatever reason. And as a result, you know, I feel like I have a, I have when I get them, I have much more of a limited lifespan with them. So in general, yeah. what I've seen happen with some of the stuff that Davidoff's doing with their Habano releases right now, uh, you know, Phil Zengi, you know, with the Indian motorcycle, Habano is great as well as his regular debonair. Uh, you know, Drew Estate, the T52 is a Habano, you know, yeah. I'm going, and I'm going to this yeah. day, one of my, yeah. To, to, yeah, to this day, one of my favorite within their portfolio because of that wrapper. No, oh, exactly. Exactly. All right. This is, this is an interesting one. Lancero <laughs> or Lonsdale. Oh, now see now, now we're getting back to the big, big, long argument in the humidors. Um, boy, that, I mean, you really put me on the spot of this one because Again, my gut is I gravitate towards Lancero, but there's two tough problems with Lancero. One is construction, because a Lancero has to be constructed perfect. You you know, especially if you're talking about a classic Lancero that's a 38 instead of a 40, there's zero room for error. You, you can't even make 2% error. You get uh, burn issues. You get plug issues. Whereas a Lonsdale, maybe you have a little bit of freedom there. I'm going to throw a curveball here, and I'm going to say, because it's a, a generic question that applies to all product, I'm gonna have to go with Lonsdale. We're we're four for four. What are we five four for four? Because yeah, <laughs> I go Lonsdale as well. Um, I will say, 2016 has been the best year of Lanceros I've seen in a long time. No question. So, no question. Um, the, the, the stuff, the some of the Lanceros that have come out this year. Um, I know you know you start with Protocol Lancero. You've talked a lot about that. I believe you put a very high rating on that. I, I did. Yeah. I think I got a little bit of flack from Logan on that one because of the rating, but, uh, it, you know, and like you said, there's other Lanceros out there and they're all sort of sitting in that like immediate, you get an inch in and you're like, this is a box buy. I can't believe yeah. it. Yeah. Crux to connoisseur is another one. Um, yeah. And, you know, I got to make a comment about that, about that protocol. Lancero. did I call it that you were going to like that? I know you, when you, when I did the show last time, we talked yep. about that. cigar. I yeah, knew you, you said, were going to love that. Just cigar. wait. Yeah, you said just wait until you smoke this. So I smoked it at the show, which you know, you've talked about. It's not an ideal place to review or, or really get the true elements of a cigar because you got so much going on. But when I actually had the chance to sit down with that cigar and truly put my mind and, and soul into that cigar, I was like, this is everything that I want in a Lancero. And, you know, again, not taking anything away because you, you talked about the Crux de Connoisseur. And uh, I think I reviewed that late last year. And I was like, this is going to be one of the best Lanceros that's going to come out next year. And then you turn around, you know, and you've got like all these Lanceros that hit the market in 2016. And I don't think you wouldn't even classify any of the Lanceros releases in 2016 as being good. They've all been the the floor for those have been great. Or above. Yeah, yeah, and I'll say this: you know, that land, that Crux de Lanceros number two was my highest rated cigar this year, as well. And from, and like I said, I'd answer this question, and I'd almost always say Lonsdale, um, too, it, it, for a lot of reasons. You know, and there's not a lot of true Lanceros either out there. And I think the ones yeah, we've absolutely. been talking about are true Lanceros. These are set 38 ring gauge. Here we're talking about. So, because I think when, general, you, when you go up. Yeah, sorry. When you go up to that forty ring gauge, I think you get an extra half leaf, and that you know it's it. it I mean, I hate to say it, but it's kind of cheating because when you blend to a thirty eight, that's really restrictive, both in your construction and the leaves you can choose. You, if you move it up to a forty, you've got a lot more to play with. But when you stick in that seven thirty eight, and then you can deliver on that, outstanding. Yeah, and I remember we had Scott Weeks on the night you and I did the show last time. He talked about the challenge he had of preserving the integrity of that blend. And I think that's another Lancero where he knocked it out of the park too with that with that uh, Reserva Habano blend. Recluse. Yeah, and, it, and and I'm expecting that Recluse Lancero to land on a lot of top ten lists this year. Um, I mean, Scott came out with a lot of different sizes, and they're all very very good. But you know, I keep coming back to his Lanceros, and they're they're incredible. They're they're nothing short of incredible. I agree. I agree. So our, our next so far we're, we haven't disagreed on. Uh, 
But this one, let's see what this one is. Open footer or closed footer on a cigar? <laughs> you are you are tough. You're asking some very tough questions. So one of the sort of prominent um, cigar makers out there that sort of does the closed foot, I think of immediately Enrique Sanchez in 1502. Um, he, he calls it the flavor lock and it kind of protects the foot. And obviously it locks in the aromas and the flavors within the cigar. And that's tough because I do like the presentation on a closed foot. Um, I don't find that I have a lot of uh, lighting issues. I know that was my initial concern is if you have the wrapper covering the foot, does it still ignite properly? And it does. That's tough, Coop. I, you know what? I'm going to let you answer first this time, and then I'm going to come in and hopefully uh, spoil this decision here. Okay, that's fair enough. Um, I'm going open footer, uh, and it's not so much the combustion issues, but a lot of times I struggle where once I light that cigar, and if that closed footer doesn't combust in a certain way correctly, it it starts it starts to get a little you get a little fraying on it. You get some yeah. loose tobacco, so. And it, and it, plus, I think it constricts the dry drawer a bit. You know. Yeah, I'm gonna. I'm, I, I I hate to go six for six with you, but I'm gonna have to go six for six because I, I think on top of that, one of the things that I really like about an open foot is you can really get a sense of the aromas of that tobacco before you light it. Whereas with a closed foot, you really are still getting the wrapper the wrapper aroma, and I can't get a sense of the tobaccos before I light it up. So I, I'm unfortunately we're going six for six. I'm gonna have to go open foot as well. Okay, so the next couple ones pertain to wrappers, um, and I'll, I'll, to be fair, I'll go first on a couple of these as well. Just to, um, <laughs> so uh, Connecticut broadleaf or Pennsylvania broadleaf. Uh, I'm go- look. I love both both those types of broadleafs as well. Um, I'm going Connecticut broadleaf. I think there's a reason why Connecticut broadleaf is more prevalent in the market. I think there is a place for Pennsylvania broadleaf. Certainly, um, I think it provides a different variety, but in general, I find that Connecticut Broadleaf just brings a little more to the table uh, on that. Uh, boy, we're going seven for seven here, Coop, because I agree with you. I think you know, the thing with Connecticut Broadleaf is the people in the industry that work with Connecticut Broadleaf really know what they're doing. And you you really, when someone puts out a Connecticut Broadleaf release, you don't get a subpar release. Now, what I think is interesting, and we've seen a little bit of that this year, is some people have been using Pennsylvania Broadleaf in the filler. And that's that's an interesting change up because I think the cigars that are coming with Pennsylvania Broadleaf in the filler, they're very different. They're a unique product in the market. And, you know, if we we're talking about in the filler, I would say Pennsylvania Broadleaf in the filler, hands down over the wrapper choice. But it, I just can't pick against Connecticut Broadleaf. They're just such a great wrapper and it's used so well in the industry. Have you spoke Bishop's Blend yet? No, I I was going to order some Bishop Blend. Uh, I'm going to be down in Miami for a couple days before I head off to Esteli, and I was looking to see if I could kind of coordinate getting some Bishop Blend blends uh, sent to my hotel, but the timing just wasn't right. So I unfortunately I missed that window. But I've heard and I've read lots of people are going bananas over that. I've smoked it, um, and here's what's real. So that what's unique about that cigar now? It's not wrapper; it's filler. They're using Connecticut and, and Pennsylvania in there. And I think what James Brown of, of Black Label Trading Company, it's, who makes that blend, it's a boutique blend that, you, that folks haven't heard of that cigar. He's got Connecticut and Pennsylvania broadleaf, but he's using a Habano, a Corrine Habano binder, which I think is more in there for combustion. And I think what you do is what, what, what that cigar does is you get the best of both. If you want to kind of taste both of those flavors in there, um, you know, you get a little more of the chocolatey notes from the Connecticut broadleaf. You're going to get a little more of the minerally component. I find Pennsylvania broadleaf has a little more of a mineral component. Not That's yeah. not a bad thing. It provides some nice balance, um, and it gives it a little strength. That, that cigar, you're going to be able to pick it up with that cigar, um, I think, very well. Yeah, and that's, I mean, since I've been reading the buzz in that cigar, it's been very high on my list to try. I think, I mean, everything with Black Works, uh, Black Label Trading Company is a bit limited and not, you know, it's not a, a fake limited. They're limited to the amount of tobacco they produce. So there's only going to be a certain amount in the first run. So, you know, if that's a cigar you're considering, you want to you want to jump on that blend very quickly because once it sells out, it's tough to say when that's going to come back into stock, if it does. Exactly. Yeah, Exactly. All right, the next rapper. Uh, this is the Paul. This is for Paul, who probably would have wrote this in on the uh, Habano and Maduro one. But uh, <laughs> U- U.S. U.S. Connecticut shade or Ecuadorian Connecticut shade? 
Oh boy. So for me, in if you'd again, if you'd asked me a year and a half, two years ago, it would have been uh, Connecticut Shade. Uh, I mean, the Valley has produced fantastic, consistent tobacco and consistent blends. But I just feel like wrappers coming out of Ecuador and specifically the Ecuadorian Shade has has just been you. And I don't know if it's because it's been used so well. But for me, the Ecuadorian Shade now has really taken the forefront. And when I see a cigar bre- blended with an Ecuadorian Shade, I immediately go. I'm probably going to like this. I'm going to pick it up blind, even if I haven't tasted it. So for me, Ecuadorian Shade, hands down. All right, this is the first one we disagree on. I'm going to go U.S. I still think, look, I think it's easier. I'm not a blender, but I think it's, it, it, is, it is more hit or miss with a U.S. Connecticut Shade. I think it is a tougher cigar to blend. For whatever reason, it does seem like a tougher cigar to blend. But when I get a good U.S. Connecticut Shade, it, it, it is great. I mean, I go back to the uh, the new AJ Fernandez New World Connecticut, and that's using a U.S. Absolutely, yeah. um, it's it's right on the money. You know, Monte Cristo, the the uh, white vintage that came out is another one that's really really good. So yeah, I think it's. I just find you can get something a little more unique with that. Um, but again, there's some great Ecuadorian Connecticut shade wrappers. But I'm gonna go U.S. with this one. So that's the first one we disagree on. And I, I think if Paul were here, I, I think I can fairly confidently say he would also probably go U.S. Connecticut Shade. I think so, too. But yep. he likes a lot of them, yeah. Yep. 10-count boxes or 20-count boxes? Now, see, that's an interesting question, and I have a, a very unique perspective now being in the industry because I know there's two challenges with a 20 with a 10-count box. One is... One of the and people need to understand that the box cost as a total component of your packaging is very very expensive. So from a manufacturing standpoint, ten count boxes are a great way to get your product out there, but they're they're a bit of a loss leader in the sense that you you know you do have to spend more in that product and people are, can't you can't raise the price in your ten count boxes versus you know comparatively to your twenty counts. So from the industry perspective, twenty count box is the way it is. But from the retail perspective, from a consumer perspective, for me especially, 10 count boxes all day long because one, you're not, you, you know, it's kind of that perfect. You know, we talk about box split versus box buy. 10 count boxes make that an easy choice because you can pick up one 10 count or two 10 counts. And of course, the, the challenge with that is you generally don't see a release in a line where it is a 10 count and a 20 count. It's, you know, like talking, going back to the protocol on Cero, that's a 10 count release. If it came in a 20 count, would I probably buy it in a 20 count? Well, I probably would because I, I went crazy over that cigar, but I really like that it's available in a, in a 10 count. So as a consumer, absolutely 10 count from a retail perspective and manufacturing perspective, I think 20 counts the winner. But for me personally, I'm going to have to go 10 count. Yeah, I went 10 count as well, and it was kind of the same rationale. I came at it from the consumer end of things. And w- again, when I'm at an event, I if I want to buy two boxes, you know, two 10 count boxes, I could walk out with two different types of cigars there. Now, yep. there is that special cigar that I'll buy, you know, the 20 or the 24 count boxes. I have done that. But in general, I think if if, if, if I'm leaning more towards that box, box worthy purchase and the 10s out there, uh, and, and in my opinion, the presentation is just as good um, yeah. from it. So I'm going to go 10 count box, and they're easier for me to store in my humidor as well. And and I think you nailed it. Like from a B and M perspective, one of the big advantages is you're not you're not sort of blowing all of your cigar purchasing finance, assuming that you have limitations on what you can spend, which most people should. You can get one blend in one brand in a 10 count and then still be able to pick up a second box. So from a B&M perspective, it's a win-win because someone gets a little bit more a, a little bit more uh, chance to try a couple different products instead of you know putting all of their money into one product, which is bad for the manufacturers on one hand, but I think it gives you a much better uh, experience across the market. Agree, agree. So these next two, right, are primary ballots. And we're going to take the, each of our two winners, and then we'll put them in a general election, so to speak. All right. All right. So the first one is, we're going to call this the Caribbean primary. Um, Dominican Republic or Cuba? Or <laughs> or, or, country of origin for a cigar. Country of origin. Well, I'm going to write, this is the first one I think I'm going to write in, uh, not because I'm afraid to answer the question, but because I think for my palate, and this is just speaking as a, as a there, cigar smoker, um, Nicaraguan. I'm going to have to write in well, Nicaraguan. Well, well, there's another primary question. Oh, there's another primary question. Okay, well, then I'll just, I'll keep it on point. Um, okay. I'm, you yeah. know, I, 
<laughs> I'm a Canadian. Yeah. I can smoke both. I think that, uh, not get political here, but I think some of the things that have gone on lately uh, are not good. Um, I'm going to have to go keep it domestic Dominican. Okay. And the next primary question is the Central America one, which is Honduras or Nicaragua. Boy, that's, I mean, that's a tough one. I think if you had put it Nicaraguan versus Dominican, I think you'd get a lot more furious debate. Not that Honduras doesn't produce great cigars, because they do. They produce fantastic cigars. But, you know, I, I, as I say, I'm about to leave Destiny, so I'd be remiss to say Nicaragua all day long. Okay. So I'll give you my, I'll give you my choices. Um, we have the same, we have the same ones. Uh, Dominican, I think what's going on in the Dominican, look, I just went to Cuba and I had a lot of respect for what's going on in Cuba. I know there's differing opinions on that, but I think right now, as far as innovation goes, I think what's coming out of the DR is right now, uh, has an edge. Um, so I'm, I'm going with the Dominican Republic there. And I'd say Honduras and Nicaragua, a very, very tough one. Um, there are some very, very good Honduran-made cigars that I think we don't you know, get the credit. I look at what CLE is doing, uh, some of the um, stuff coming out of um, Rocky and Camacho. But I, I'm going to yep. go Nicaragua because I think there's just been – that's created so many more choices for the consumer right now that I'm going to go uh, Nicaragua. Um, and so we, we both have the same general election. Um, to be fair, <laughs> I'll go first with this one. So Dominican right. Republic versus Nicaragua. I'm going uh, Dominican Republic. Again, I think there's a little more innovation coming out of the DR in terms of hybrid seeds. I'm looking at a lot of what Davidoff's doing uh, out there. I really like what Cassad is doing, LaFleur. Um, not a knock on Nicaragua. I'd give a slight edge, though, to the Dominican Republic. I, th I think the Dominican has the advantage when you talk about tobaccos, because I think when you look at the tobaccos that are out there, you know, hands down from a, from a paper perspective, I think Dominican has the edge, but for my palate, and I think what, you know, we've certainly seen in the last few years, three, four years, the explosion of boutique brand blends and brands that have come out of Nicaragua. Um, not only is there this sort of cascade, this huge range of, of product you can try, but again, speaking sort of from my personal palate experience, cascade is huge. I, I love Nicaraguan tobacco, and I love the blends that are coming out of Nicaragua. So for me, Nicaragua. So I'm, I'm glad we got a little bit of a, a switch up there. Yep, yep, yep. So uh, there was a lot of good comments I saw in the chat room as well on, on these various topics too. Um, so hopefully that just put a little more um, spin as far as, you know, <laughs> maybe there's something a little more that uh, we uh, – you know, have a little bit positive spin as we do in the debonair idea. <laughs> with, uh, so I'll be fair. I'm going to, I'm going to go just, just to kind of uh, close the loop with our sponsor here. It's interesting because with debonair and I smoke a lot of debonair Indian motorcycle, I'm a Habano guy with the Indian motorcycle and I'm a Maduro guy with the debonair line. So, um, you know, so it's kind of interesting there as well. Absolutely. Ooh, so and those are great. Those are great questions. I appreciate the fact that you're kind of, it's fostering, um, enthusiastic debate, but still keeping within this, the realm of cigars. So, you know, we're all uh, brothers and sisters of the Leafs, so we're all keeping it debonair as we talk about these. Everyone's got different taste profiles. It's it's a fun debate, and we keep it fun. Exactly, exactly. So with that, we will take a little bit of a – we'll take a break for our sponsors, and then we will come back with uh, a Hot topic segment. So stay tuned. Brand Premium Cigars, one of the fastest growing boutique cigar companies, providing smokers a portal into the old Cuban tradition of perfect balance and the lost art of progressive flavor construction. Roberto Palayo Duran began his career in tobacco over two decades ago in Havana, where his reputation grew within Cuban circles. The creation of Duran Premium Cigars has given Roberto the platform to introduce a series of cigars that offer the same quality, construction, and detail which he perfected while in Cuba. Brands include the ultra premium Roberto P. Duran premium cigar series, Azan Cigars, Nea, and Baracoa. Duran Cigars uses a seed-to-humidor approach as all tobacco is grown on their farms and rolled in their factory in Esteli, Nicaragua. Rollers have been carefully chosen to carry out Roberto's precise method to ensure progressive flavor in each cigar. Duran Cigars invites you to make their premium your standard. 
Experience the world through the eyes of an icon with the new Macanudo Inspirado line. Created for a global palette, Macanudo Inspirado defies convention. Handcrafted with the world's finest tobaccos, Inspirado delivers a unique international smoking experience. Find Inspirado Orange at fine tobaccos everywhere and Inspirado Black online and in your favorite catalogs. Ready to be inspired? Check out Macanudo Inspirado now at macanudo.com. CAO has brought you iconic cigars over the years. Brazilian, Italian, La Traviata, done in a playful nature with a unique twist. Travel to the exciting world of CAO and back in just under an hour with any of the groundbreaking CAO world blends. Test the boundaries of style with new age brands in the 95 rated flathead. Honor the past with new classics like Pilon. Treat your palate to an array of flavors with Soul Fire and Moon Trance. At CAO, the experiences are limitless. So what's your next move? Hey, Paul, what's up? What's up, Mark? I, did you hear about the new cigar that's coming out? Which one is that? There's like 800 new ones every week. The one with the Connecticut Broadleaf wrapper. Oh, really? I love Connecticut Broadleaf. Which, uh, who makes it? Um, I think it's Nicaraguan. So Nicaraguan binder and filler, or it's made in a factory in Nicaragua? Uh, I always have to Google these, and it's taking me like an hour to find out what it is. If this is a frequent conversation with your cigar buddies, look no further than Stogie Geek's new cigar news podcast on the internet. Will Cooper, the man behind Cigar-Coop.com, and Paul Asadorian from the Stogie Geeks produce a weekly show covering the latest cigar news, new blends, cigar manufacturer announcements, and more. Subscribe to the video version on YouTube or get the audio version in your favorite podcast catcher. Head on over to stogienews.tv to subscribe today. Welcome back to the Stogie Geek Show. This is episode 208 on November 7th, 2016. Will Cooper from Studio C in North Carolina. Paul has the night off, but we have uh, Riley and Mark uh, at the Billiger North America Studios in Rhode Island uh, at the Hub, kind of keeping things moving really slow, to, uh, slow smooth tonight. <laughs> Apologize for that, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Apologize for that slip up, but we have cigar surgeon John Reiner filling in for Paul. John, always great for you to be here. Coop, it's always a pleasure to be on the show. Thanks so much. Yeah. Last week I kind of so last week I kind of debuted a segment called Hot Topics, um, and if you haven't heard that one, uh, Dave Burke and Hector Alfonso kind of participated in that. We got a lot of good feedback on that segment. Um, it did go a little long. I, I do recognize it because we hit a lot of topics. So I think we'll br introduce this this segment from time to time, uh, particularly when we have someone in the industry kind of co-hosting with us. I think it's a good a good segment. Um, and and John, I kind of want. I, I'm going to admit I'm I'm stealing a little thunder here from you guys uh, because you guys on Cigar Chat talked about this topic on Thursday night. And if you haven't seen the, um, is it the November third Cigar Chat? That sounds right, yep. Yeah, you need to kind of go watch that. Um, John and Logan did a really, really good kind of state of the industry type type of uh, segment, which I kind of – but I knew John and I were already talking about this particular hot topic. And the hot topic is um, the strategic moves of Tabacalera USA. So let me kind of – for the audience who may not be familiar – First of all, what Tabacalera USA is, and then what is going on. I think we'll set the table with that. So Tabacalera USA is a is the U.S. premium cigar division of Imperial Tobacco. Um, if you've heard of Imperial Tobacco, um, you know they own their, their Habanos SA in Cuba. They own half of that. They're also the owners of Altadis USA here. So you're familiar with the Altadis USA brands. They... Last year, they formed this new division called Tobacco Era USA, and they put a couple things under it. One was the Altidus division, where they're making all these uh, the brands for Altidus. And then they have this other group. It's called the uh, Casa de Monte Cristo uh, group right now. And what we and this is really where it's stimulating the discussion is what we've started to see over the past year is this Casa de Monte Cristo concept um, is starting to spread, where we're starting to see more and more retail operations now either one being acquired by uh tobacco or usa or two partnering with an existing retailer so for example this past week and this is what spurred the whole conversation 
Serious Cigars in Houston, one of the biggest retailers in, in the Houston market, they have an e-commerce site. Tobacco Air USA bought them out, lock, stock, and barrel. Um, they've also bought the cigar in stores in New York City, iconic stores in New York for a long time. But they've also partnered with, you know, Smoke In in um, in South Florida. Uh, one of uh, Abe's stores is a Casa de Monte Cristo Lounge. So they've kind of, and they've also partnered, I know, with a store in Miami uh, with Prime Cigar. So I mean, there's so there's a different combination. But what we're seeing here is we're seeing. This is a very interesting move that's starting to take place here. It's been a controversial move, John. No, I mean, it's been there's been folks who have been very critical of these moves. Absolutely. And I, I think, you know, I was actually surprised. I mean, obviously, the timing of it, we've got the election coming up. So the, the, the Facebook discussions are a little overwhelmed by the, the political discussions right now. But I was really surprised when you dropped the news that there wasn't more of it. There was a few, a couple debates on, on Facebook, but there really was far less discussion about this than I was expecting. Because I feel like this is Imperial as a, as a global entity. And Imperial operates, for people who aren't aware, Imperial operates all around the world. They, they operate in a lot of challenging markets. The market in the United States is one of the easiest markets in the world to operate in. And I think this just goes to show you, and we'll, we'll certainly get into it, that Imperial is playing a game of chess and some other companies and some other stores might be playing games of checkers. And when, and when we get into it, I think you'll start to see, you know, some of the moves they're making make a lot of sense when you think down the road three to five years where this is going to end up. Yeah, and, and, and I'll say this. There was an article written by Charlie Minato on Half Wheel last Friday. I think he did a really, really good job of Absolutely. kind of I – mean, ex- I mean, he did an excellent job. He broke it down um, in terms of he – his re- I mean, there were a couple of maybe – there were a couple of fact points I think he was a little off on, but I don't think that was really the issue as much as – he laid out why this is, not, this is the beginning. And why this yeah. is going to continue. And I really encourage folks. He did a very, very nice job in our. We got to give him credit where it's due there on that. Um, you know, but, you know, when it's interesting because when Tobacco or USA went into the Dallas market, uh, they opened a brand new store there. That set off a lot of um, a lot of negative reaction. I, I, for some reason, the da- I don't know if it was the Dallas market. It set up a lot of negative reaction. Now. Another thing to understand is Tobacco Area USA, they also own the JR Cigar Stores, uh, which are commonly found mostly in North Carolina. There's, there's a few others throughout the country. And, you know, they st- when they when they um, they last year, they kind of started to do an overhaul of the JR stores where JR stores were known as a discount tobacco outlet. Um, and they kind of had a big flea market kind of mixed in there. They basically cleared out the flea market. They cleared out the discount stuff. And they started to change the face of JR Cigar to more of a um, high end lounge. I mean, very uh, more of a boutique type of store in a lot of ways, uh, balancing it out with some of the big brands. I have been, per- I have personally been to the JR stores, and I have found they have done a fantastic job. And I know some folks may not like to hear that, but they have done a fantastic job at bringing the ultimate cigar consumer experience. I mean, I can't ask for more as a consumer, and I'll be honest, I can't ask for more as a media person in terms of how forthcoming they have been explaining their strategy, making themselves available for questions. So I, you know, there's there's some positive. And I get I get the other side of the coin here where it, it's the mom and pop stores is what only wants to suffer. I totally get that. I'm sensitive to that as well. I think if you, if you don't follow Skip Martin on Facebook, you should, because Skip was one of the ones that sort of had a really balanced reaction to this. And uh, I think it's I think it's really interesting because this is really, I see this as a reaction to some of the decisions that have been made in the U.S. regarding uh, limitations, especially with the FDA legislation. This was only a matter of time before this sort of thing started to occur. You've, you've got a marketplace that's in flux. You've got a marketplace where there's a lot of uncertainty. And again, Imperial has a lot of experience working in markets you know, five, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, where the things that the United States are starting to see today with the FDA decisions have already happened. Imperial's got all of this experience operating in those markets. They have the textbook on what happens within the markets. And, you know, again, not to get political, but I think this is sort of the natural result of putting a restriction in the market. I'm I'm a, a big believer that 
You want as much free market competition as possible. And what the FDA has really done here is they've limited the market in such a way that it's going to be very, very tough for, you know, uh, a new B and M, uh, a new B and M chain to come in and operate in this market. That's that's become very very restricted. I I I think you nailed that really well. I I do think there there still very much is a segment of the market that I think there's room for both. Is where I'm going to kind of get at. Um, Absolutely. You know there, you know there the, the mom and pop stores. I, I think in the end, when you have a, a, a cigar store. And you look at, and you, maybe you could comment on this better than I can, but this is my feeling. When you when you're putting product in your humidor, ultimately, what should you sell that price point? And and you should sell it at the suggested retail price. I think you're I think you're you're getting greedy if you go higher, because obviously someone's going to find it for a lesser price. And I think you're selling yourself short if you discount it. So in the end, I think you know you have this if you have a level playing field with price. The next thing, what's the next thing becomes? It becomes the overall experience. And we have some really great retailers in this country. I mean, we do. We have some fantastic retailers. And I think ultimately people will go to a cigar shop. And if all things are equal, the thing it's going to come down to is that experience. And if they feel comfortable with the owners, the people, you know, just it's kind of an extension of their home in a lot of ways. I, I think they'll be OK. At the same time, I think, you know, these what what I've seen at the Casa de Monte Cristo stores, they're offering another option. And I, I think, you know, you kind of touched on it. I, I absolutely would echo the sentiment, the idea that a rising tide raises all boats. And I think that's really important before, you know, and it, again, it's your business, especially with the smaller shop, you know, it's hard not to be reactionary to this, but the rising tide that raises all boats is good for you. When you, when you come up with these flagship stores that are really bringing this all, it's not a boutique experience. It's, you know, to, for lack of a better expression, you call it the Apple store experience. You're bringing a super premium, super high end, top quality, and like you said, the lounges and everything about these these shops are done top notch. No one thinks this is a fly by night operation. You go in there and you think this is nothing but top level professionalism. And to me, that's great for the industry because, you know, there's certainly a lot of misconceptions among non cigar smokers out there about what it is in the cigar industry and what a store is. And I think this does a great job, both from the perspective of again rising all the boats by bringing this ultra premium high-end experience to the marketplace and people walking by that store will recognize that you know this isn't just a couple of guys a couple old dudes smoking cigars in the back room this is a this is a very apple-like experience where people can come in and again you know you touched on the price point they're not looking to discount the marketplace in fact they're looking to bring the marketplace up and you know well, again not to go ahead yeah go ahead no i agree i agree so, you know, when we talk about Apple, like Apple does not discount their product. In fact, quite the opposite. They charge a premium for their product. I don't think they're doing that with the Castle Cast Monte Cristo line. I think what they're saying is the MSRP is the price. We have a variety of product on the shelf. We sell it for a fair price. You can come in and get a great experience of a big store where there's a lot of product on display and it's sold at a fair price. Is there still room for the, the mom and pop B&M? Absolutely there is because... You know, although you're you're offering this ultra sort of premium experience, there's still room in the segment for both companies to operate. But I, I do think it's interesting, and again, you know, and maybe we'll get into it now, talking about their acquisition with JR with Smoke In, and now I think the the big tipping point here was Serious Cigars, which, by the way, is an outstanding, um, an outstanding. I think they've got three stores, four stores. Four if you stores, haven't yeah. been to. Four stores, if you haven't been to Sirius Cigars and you're down in Houston, you have to go into Sirius. There's a lot of great shops around there. Uh, I've had excellent experiences out of Sirius, and I don't expect that to change. In fact, if anything, I expect them to inject some money in there and, again, just bring it up to the next level. What I think is interesting is when you start to forecast out three to five years, and you touched on it in the intro, you talk about Imperial. Imperial owns 50% of Cuba Tobacco. Now, I think it's an inevitability that the market for Cuban cigars are going to open in the United States. I mean, regardless of every, you know, I know there's a lot of feelings in the marketplace. There's a lot of people that came from Cuba and lost their lands to the Cuban government. But on a long enough timeline, you, and especially with the loosening of the of the rules and restrictions to Cuba, we won't talk about that in this segment because we don't have enough time. But 
you can definitely see that eventually, one way or another, Cuban tobacco is going to enter into the market. Now, what a lot of people probably don't understand, and I have an intimate understanding of here in Canada, is that with Cuba tobacco, there is one importer and one yep. distributor for Cuba tobacco. So now you talk about, and here's where it gets interesting, Imperial Tobacco, if they have a line of stores, these ultra boutique, ultra, or I say ultra boutique, ultra premium sort of flagship stores, you come in with a store like that, and let's say the embargo drops in two years, and you can put 100 facings or 75 facings of Cuban tobacco on your shelf, along with these other products that have been in the market for a very long time, you're going to blow the market out of the water in a good way, because you're going to create this high-end frenzy for Cuban tobacco that is going to, you know, again, the rising tide raises all boats. Just because they're in looking at Cuban tobacco does not mean that they're not going to go crazy buying Dominican, Honduran, and Nicaraguan cigars. You're you're 100 percent right. Now, the one thing I will say is they are now there is a group under Imperial, and I'm not sure how it fits into tobacco or USA. And I apologize to my friend Alan, who probably knows a little more about this than, than me, because uh, he works for them. But there is a distribution arm that right now called Santa Clara Tobacco, which is under there. So they they have something in place already. Yeah. Um. So they they do, do and, that, and that's where I'm seeing that that entry point. Now, this is another kind of thing I've kind of I want to kind of compare this. And Charlie kind of mentioned this in his article was the whole. So Davidoff's been doing this. Davidoff's Davidoff's been been doing this for a while. They've been doing this. Yeah, they've been doing this. And and there hasn't been an outrage on Davidoff doing this. I mean, Davidoff, it's kind of the opposite. It's not. And I'm wondering if 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 there is this outrage. I don't want to say outrage. There there seems to be more opposition to this. I'm wondering if if it is because we're looking at, you know, hey, this Imperial is going to have this part cornered when the Cuban cigars come in. Well, and, and I can see why people might be concerned about that. You know, again, it's it's a bit of a reactionary thing because we don't know how that's going to play out. But I can tell you, because I do operate in the market where it's it's an open market for all brands. So you can walk into a humidor in any of my stores and you can pick up a Cuban cigar or you can pick out a non-Cuban cigar. And you might think that, well, obviously everyone's going to go and buy the Cubans, but the Cubans have been on the market here forever. We've never had a restriction. And I can tell you, just as many people buy, if not more, buy non-Cubans as by Cubans. And in fact, there's a lot of smokers that will pick up a Cuban product and then turn around and pick up, you know, the latest release from AJ Fernandez and be happy to buy both. And, you know, I, I think it's one of these things we need to realize that, first of all, the you know, although the, the American market is more than 50 percent of the world's consum- consumption of cigars, as a, as a total amount of people that are smoking in, in, this, in the uh, United States, that market is only growing. And it's been growing for five, six years, and it continues to grow, and hopefully will continue to grow. The only, the only, I don't see a downside to this from the perspective of if they start bringing Cuban cigars and bring more um, limelight to the cigar market and cigar smoking and the whole aspect of cigar smoking, that's great business for everyone. Even if you don't have 50 facings of the new Cuban cigars, they're still going to come into your store because they're excited. You can, maybe you only have two facings when you know when the embargo drops. Maybe you only have two facings. Just because they come into your store to buy the Romaneones doesn't mean they're not going to pick up the Hoya de Nicaragua. In fact, it's very likely that, you know, as an experienced tobacconist, you're going to be able to direct them to products that meet their needs. And I don't see this as being a bad thing. I think all stores will benefit from this. Um, you know, we, we, you know, going back to Apple, just because Apple's in this, in the, in the market segment of cell phones, doesn't mean that Google and Android has not been killing it because they have, again, it just brings more, um, consumers to that available market and just it, it just raises that standard a little bit and it, i don't see that as a bad thing raising standards in the cigar industry and raising standards for stores that's a good thing for for everybody including the the um the stores themselves yeah and you know they are taking some other routes with this you know the big example i'll give is um prime cigar that opened up in miami it's a partnership and it may have given a retailer an opportunity to play on a stage that he might not, he or she might not be able to play on, without having a partner like like a tobacco or a USA in it. Same with what Jeff Borshowitz did in Tampa with his Davidoff store. Um, 
it's a partnership that he probably would not have had his opportunity. And he certainly still has his other retail stores that that are his. So it's kind of, it's kind of opened up some opportunities. And we go back again, where this whole market right now, where it, it is, there is a reactionary market. There are people, there is a panic going on to some extent, but it's also creating some opportunities that if this didn't, if this model didn't exist, we could be looking at, at some dire consequences right now. Yeah, and, I, I think you hit. Sorry, go ahead, Coop. Yeah, no, go ahead. Yeah, I was done. I was, I was going to say no. I think I think that's a great example using Jeff Borshowitz because Jeff has a very successful line of stores that uh, drive a lot of audience. They have they, you know I've been down there multiple times. We've been down there together, yeah. and you, you you say to Jeff, well, has the Davidoff store taken away from the rest of the stores? I'll bet you tell you no. It's been the best thing ever because all it does is shine more light on all of the offerings we have across of our across our stores. Yeah, they might go into the Davidoff store and pick up a Davidoff product, but that's not going to prevent them from going to any of the other Sand Lake location, the downtown location, and picking up plenty of product from those stores and having a different experience. It, it's not competing within itself. It's creating, uh, you know, it's almost like carving out a new place in the market that, do, it, I mean, yeah, it kind of competes, but it really doesn't because you're carving out a new experience and it doesn't really take away from the other experiences that are in the market, at least in my opinion. Yeah, no, I, I, I completely agree, agree on that. Um, you know, and you know, I, we're going to, there's no doubt we're going to see more of this. I mean, there's, there's some no markets doubt. if you, if you start looking at right now, um, I mean, I don't know any information. I just spent a weekend down in Atlanta, which is a huge cigar market. I, I, I would guess that's a target. Davidoff's already gotten into that Atlanta market, you know, so I could definitely see that. I see the Phoenix market as another one. That I mean, for sure, those would be ones that are uh, that are definitely target areas. The the DC probably would be um, a third one that's out there. You know, but there's also you know, for example, you know, Holtz up in um, Philadelphia. You know, Ashton's had that for a long time. They they they've been yeah. doing this for a long time as well. So um, you know, like I said, in in the end, I think I I get it, I, but I also think sometimes the retailers are selling themselves short. Because forget you know, there's like I said, these are some really good retailers out there, and, and I'm not talking necessarily big ones like Jeff. You know, there's, there's some very small shop retailers, and I I have I believe in a lot of these guys, and I think the ones who are willing to kind of take the challenge, so to speak, and and, and kind of go forward, I think I think they're going to be successful as well, and I think they're going to be able to offer you know alternatives. You know, I look at what like Dave Garofalo does up at Two Guys. Does any guy have more unique events than that guy does? Yeah, exactly. And, 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 Great example. Yeah, I mean, it he keeps it interesting. I mean, he just he keeps it interesting, and and, and I think you know, Abe at Smoke Inn's another one. So I mean, these these guys, uh, Jeff, you know, we mentioned Jeff. So there there are a lot of these guys out there that I I just think. Uh, you know, we'll, we'll, you know, we may, I, I'm, we'll definitely see more of these acquisitions. It's going to become more of a, you know, and I, and you know, don't forget general with cigars international either. So that's something else to think about. You know, that they could be, they've kind of sort of redefined a little what they're doing up in Pennsylvania, and I would expect that model to at some point they'll probably take that national as well. They've done some similar restructuring yeah. under uh, under general um, last year. They kind of a, a similar structure model. They did to what uh, Imperial just did, and, and you know I think you talked about it that for some of these B and M's this is an opportunity. You know you you can't necessarily look at this as a negative thing. I mean I know people are kind of viewing this as a as a competition thing, but as you know we talk about in in Miami that's an excellent opportunity for some. You know it's it's not cheap opening a cigar store. You know even down in the states it is it is a very big investment, and when you have another company that's willing to partner with you to to help you accomplish something big that you wouldn't be able to accomplish on your own, again not only is that great for you. It's great for the cigar market in that area. And, you know, you talk about Dave Garofalo and his chain of stores. If if one of these Casa de Monte Cristos were, were to open up in the New Hampshire area, would that take away from his customer base? I don't think so. I think, you know, when you have a, a secure relationship with your customer base, your, your customers know you, they know your product, you have great great experience and great knowledge. You can help direct them when, the, when they need that in the, in the store. That's not going to take away from the experience. They're going to enjoy both. And again, I think it just brings more people into the industry from a consumer perspective. And that's that really is great for everyone. It's it's absolutely great for everyone. I agree. 
I agree. Any any other thoughts on that? Well, again, I think it'll be you know this. I think really, from my perspective, it kind of tipped the hat of this is chess. Imperial has this experience. They know where this is going. Again, you know, you've talked about it. I've talked about it. This is only the beginning of the FDA. And what they're doing is they're securing the spot in the market to make the market uh, stable and consistent so that we can continue to enjoy cigars. If they need to come in and help with B&M out, partner with them, that's going to keep that B&M in business. So your B&M doesn't go out of business so that you've still got choice in the marketplace. And really, at the end of the, the, end of the day, that's what it's about. It's about choice. And as a consumer, you can still choose to go to your local B&M or go to Casa Monte Cristo and come back to your local B&M. It doesn't take away from that experience. Don't think that it does. No, I mean, like I said, I'm, I'm, I know a lot of those Casa de Monte Cristo stores. You know, I go to Abe's store down in Boynton Beach. But I'll tell you what, when I go to mm. Miami, I go to, I go to Caribbean Cigar. That's the official Cigar Coop store of Miami, by the way. Um, and Alan, is, he does a great – you need to go visit Caribbean Cigar, John, if you're down there. One of the, <laughs> I'll have to check yeah. it out. Well, really, um, and I, I, it's a great shop, and so I think stores like Caribbean Cigar, they'll, they'll be perfect. So, anyway, um, I guess with that, we will take a. That was a good segment, by the way. Thanks, thanks for that doing was a that. Segment. We, we probably could have went up for two hours with that one too, but we'll take a break. We'll come back with our stogies of the week. <laughs> 